Chapter 6 of Short Stories Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky Chapter 6 An Unpleasant Predicament Part 4 The worst of it was that Pseldonimov's circumstances were far worse than could have been imagined, in spite of the unattractiveness of his present surroundings. And why? Ivan Ilyich is lying on the floor, and Pseldonimov is standing over him, tearing his hair in despair. We will break off the thread of our story and say a few explanatory words about Porfiry Petrovich Pseldonimov. Not more than a month before his wedding, he was in a state of hopeless destitution. He came from a province where his father had served in some department and where he had died while awaiting his trial on some charge. When five months before his wedding, Pseldonimov, who had been in hopeless misery in Petersburg for a whole year before, got his birth at ten rubles a month, he revived both physically and mentally, but he was soon crushed by circumstances again. There were only two Pseldonimovs left in the world, himself and his mother, who had left the province after her husband's death. The mother and son barely existed in the freezing cold and sustained life on the most dubious substances. There were days when Pseldonimov himself went with a jug to the Fontanka for water to drink. When he got his place, he succeeded in settling with his mother in a corner. She took in washing while for four months he scraped together every farthing to get himself boots and an overcoat, and what troubles he had to endure at his office. His superiors approached him with the question, how long was it since he had had a bath? There was a rumor about him that under the collar of his uniform there were nests of bugs. But Pseldonimov was a man of strong character. On the surface he was mild and meek. He had the merest smattering of education. He was practically never heard to talk of anything. I do not know for certain whether he thought, made plans and theories, had dreams. But on the other hand, there was being formed within him an instinctive, furtive, unconscious determination to fight his way out of his wretched circumstances. He had the persistence of an ant. Destroy an ant's nest, and they will begin at once re-erecting it. Destroy it again, and they will begin again without wearying. He was a constructive house-building animal. One could see from his brow that he would make his way, would build his nest, and perhaps even save for a rainy day. His mother was the only creature in the world who loved him and she loved him beyond everything. She was a woman of resolute character, hard-working and indefatigable, and at the same time good-natured. So perhaps they might have lived in their corner for five or six years till their circumstances changed, if they had not come across the retired titular counselor Mlekopitaev, who had been a clerk in the treasury, and had served at one time in the provinces, but had lately settled in Petersburg and had established himself there with his family. He knew Pseldonimov and had at one time been under some obligation to his father. He had a little money, not a large sum of course, but there it was. How much it was, no one knew, not his wife, nor his elder daughter, nor his relations. He had two daughters, and as he was an awful bully, a drunkard, a domestic tyrant, and in addition to that, an invalid, he took it into his head one day to marry one of his daughters to Pseldonimov. I knew his father, he would say. He was a good fellow, and his son will be a good fellow. Mlekopitaev did exactly as he liked. His word was law. He was a very queer bully. For the most part, he spent his time sitting in an armchair, having lost the use of his legs from some disease which did not, however, prevent him from drinking vodka. 
for days together he would be drinking and swearing. He was an ill-natured man. He always wanted to have someone whom he could be continually tormenting. And for that purpose, he kept several distant relations. His sister, a sickly and peevish woman, two of his wives' sisters, also ill-natured and very free with their tongues, and his old aunt, who had, through some accident, a broken rib. He kept another dependent also, a Russianized German, for the sake of her talent for entertaining him with stories from the Arabian Nights. His sole gratification consisted in jeering at all these unfortunate women and abusing them every minute with all his energies. Though the latter, not accepting his wife, who had been born with toothache, dared not utter a word in his presence. He set them at loggerheads at one another, inventing and fostering spiteful backbiting and dissensions among them, and then laughed and rejoiced, seeing how they were ready to tear one another to pieces. He was very much delighted when his elder daughter, who had lived in great poverty for ten years with her husband, an officer of some sort, and was at last left a widow, came to live with him with three little sickly children. He could not endure her children, but as her arrival had increased the material upon which he could work his daily experiments, the old man was very much pleased. All these ill-natured women and sickly children, together with their tormentor, were crowded together in a wooden house on Petersburg side and did not get enough to eat because the old man was stingy and gave out to the money a farthing at a time, though he did not grudge himself vodka. They did not get enough sleep because the old man suffered from sleeplessness and insisted on being amused. In short, they were all in misery and cursed their fate. It was at that time that Mlekopitaev's eye fell upon Pseldonimov. He was struck by his long nose and submissive air. His weakly and unprepossessing younger daughter had just reached the age of 17. Though she had at one time attended a German school, she had acquired scarcely anything but the alphabet. Then she grew up rickety and anemic in fear of her crippled, drunken father's crutch in a bedlam of domestic backbiting, eavesdropping, and scolding. She had never had any friends or any brains. She had for a long time been eager to be married. In company she sat mute, but at home with her mother and the women of the household, she was spiteful and cantankerous. She was particularly fond of pinching and smacking her sister's children telling tales of their pilfering bread and sugar, and this led to endless and implacable strife with her elder sister. Her old father himself offered her to Pseldonimov. Miserable as the latter's position was, he yet asked for a little time to consider. His mother and he hesitated for a long time, but with the young lady there was to come as dowry a house and though it was a nasty little wooden house of one story, yet it was property of a kind. Moreover, they would give with her 400 rubles, and how long it would take him to save it up himself? What am I taking the man into my house for? shouted the drunken bully. In the first place, because you are all females, and I am sick of female society. I want Pseldonimov too to dance to my piping, for I am his benefactor. Then in the second place I am doing it because you are all cross and don't want it, so I'll do it to spite you. What I have said, I have said, and you beat her, Porphyry, when she is your wife. She has been possessed of seven devils ever since she was born. You beat them out of her, and I'll get the stick ready. Pseldonimov made no answer, but he was almost decided. Before the wedding, his mother and he were taken into the house, washed, clothed, provided with boots and money for the wedding. The old man took them under his protection, possibly just because the whole family was prejudiced against them. 
He positively liked Zoltana Ma's mother, so that he actually restrained himself and did not jeer at her. On the other hand, he made Zoltanimov dance the Cossack dance a week before the wedding. Well, that's enough. I only wanted to see whether you remembered your position before me or not, he said at the end of the dance. He allowed just enough money for the wedding, with nothing to spare, and invited all his relations and acquaintances. On Pseldonimov's side, there was no one but the young man who wrote for the firebrand and Akim Petrovich, the guest of honor. Pseldonimov was perfectly aware that his bride cherished an aversion for him and that she was set upon marrying the officer instead of him. But he put up with everything. He had made a compact with his mother to do so. The old father had been drunk and abusive and foul-tongued the whole of the wedding day and during the party in the evening. The whole family took refuge in the back rooms and were crowded there to suffocation. The front rooms were devoted to the dance and the supper. At last, when the old man fell asleep dead drunk at eleven o'clock, the bride's mother, who had been particularly displeased with Pseldonimov's mother that day, made up her mind to lay aside her wreath, become gracious, and join the company. Ivan Ilyich's arrival had turned everything upside down. Madame Blakopitaev was overcome with embarrassment and began grumbling that she had not been told that the general had been invited. She was assured that he had come uninvited, but was so stupid as to refuse to believe it. Champagne had to be got. Pseldonimov's mother had only one ruble, while Pseldonimov himself had not one farthing. He had to grovel before his ill-natured mother-in-law to beg for the money for one bottle and then for another. They pleaded for the sake of his future position in service, for his career. They tried to persuade her. She did at last give from her own purse, but she forced Pseldonimov to swallow such a cupful of gall and bitterness that more than once he ran into the room where the nuptial couch had been prepared and madly clutching at his hair and trembling all over with impotent rage he buried his head in the bed destined for the joys of paradise no indeed ivan Ilyitch had no notion of the price paid for the two bottles of jackson he had drunk that evening what was the horror the misery and even the despair of Pseldonimov when Ivan Ilyich's visit ended in this unexpected way. He had a prospect again of no end of misery, and perhaps a night of tears and outcries from his peevish bride and upbraidings from her unreasonable relations. Even apart from this, his head ached already and there was dizziness and mist before his eyes. And here Ivan Ilyich needed looking after. At three o'clock at night he had to hunt for a doctor or a carriage to take him home. And a carriage it must be, for it would be impossible to let an ordinary cabbie take him in that condition. And where could he get the money even for a carriage? Madame Mlekopitaev, furious that the general had not addressed two words to her and had not even looked at her supper, declared that she had not a farthing. Possibly she really had not a farthing. Where could he get it? What was he to do? Yes, indeed, he had good cause to tear his hair. Meanwhile, Ivan Ilyich was moved to a little leather sofa that stood in the dining room. While they were clearing the tables and putting them away, Pseldonimov was rushing all over the place to borrow money. He even tried to get it from the servants, but it appeared that nobody had any. He even ventured to trouble Akim Petrovich, who had stayed after the other guests. But good-natured as he was, the latter was reduced to such bewilderment and even alarm at the mention of money that he uttered the most unexpected and foolish phrases. 
Another time with pleasure, he muttered, but now you really must excuse me. Then, taking his cap, he ran as fast as he could out of the house. Only the good-natured youth who had talked about the dream book was any use at all, and even that came to nothing. He too stayed after the others, showing genuine sympathy with Pseldonimov's misfortunes. At last, Pseldonimov, together with his mother and the young man, decided in consultation not to send for a doctor, but rather to fetch a carriage and take the invalid home, and meanwhile to try certain domestic remedies till the carriage arrived, such as moistening his temples and his head with cold water, putting ice on his head, and so on. Pseldonimov's mother undertook this task. The friendly youth flew off in search of a carriage. As there were not even ordinary cabs to be found on the Petersburg side at that hour, he went off to some livery stables at a distance to wake up the coachman. They began bargaining and declared that five rubles would be little to ask for a carriage at that time of night. They agreed to come, however, for three. When at last, just before five o'clock, the young man arrived at Pseldonimov's with the carriage, they had changed their minds. It appeared that Ivan Ilyich, who was still unconscious, had become so seriously unwell, was moaning and tossing so terribly, that to move him and take him home in such a condition was impossible and actually unsafe. What will it lead to next? said Pseldonimov, utterly disheartened. What was to be done? A new problem arose. If the invalid remained in the house, where should he be moved and where could they put him? There were only two bedsteads in the house, one large double bed in which old Mykopitaev and his wife slept, and another double bed of imitation walnut which had just been purchased and was destined for the newly married couple. All the other inhabitants of the house slept on the floor side by side on feather beds, for the most part in bad condition and stuffy, anything but presentable in fact, and even of these the supply was insufficient. There was not one to spare. Where could the invalid be put? A feather bed might perhaps have been found. It might in the last resort have been pulled from under someone, but where and on what could a bed have been made up? It seemed that the bed must be made up in the drawing room, for that room was the furthest from the bosom of the family and had a door into the passage. But on what could the bed be made? Surely not upon chairs. We all know that beds can only be made up on chairs for schoolboys when they come home for the weekend, and it would be terribly lacking in respect to make up a bed in that way for a personage like Ivan Ilyich. What would be said next morning when he found himself lying on chairs? Pseldonimov would not hear of that. The only alternative was to put him on the bridal couch. This bridal couch, as we have mentioned already, was in a little room that opened out of the dining room. On the bedstead was a double mattress, actually newly bought first hand. Clean sheets, four pillows in pink calico, covered with frilled muslin cases. The quilt was of pink satin, and it was quilted in patterns. Muslin curtains hung down from a golden ring overhead. In fact, it was all just as it should be, and the guests, who had all visited the bridal chamber, had admired the decoration of it. Though the bride could not endure Pseldonimov, she had several times in the course of the evening run in to have a look at it on the sly. What was her indignation, her wrath, when she learned that they meant to move an invalid, suffering from something not unlike a mild attack of cholera, to her bridal couch. The bride's mother took her part, broke into abuse, and vowed she would complain to her husband next day. But Pseldonimov asserted himself and insisted. 
Ivan Ilyich was moved into the bridal chamber and a bed was made up on chairs for the young people. The bride, whimpered, would have liked to pinch him, but dared not disobey. Her papa had a crutch with which she was very familiar, and she knew that her papa would call her to account next day. To console her, they carried the pink satin quilt and pillows and muslin cases into the drawing room. At that moment, the youth arrived with the carriage and was horribly alarmed that the carriage was not wanted. He was left to pay for it himself, and he never had as much as a ten kopeck piece. Pseldonimov explained that he was utterly bankrupt. They tried to parley with the driver, but he began to be noisy and even to batter on the shutters. How it ended, I don't know exactly. I believe the youth was carried off to Pesky by way of a hostage to 4th Rozdensky Street, where he hoped to rouse a student who was spending the night at a friend's and to try whether he had any money. It was going on for six o'clock in the morning when the young people were left alone and shut up in the drawing room. Pseldonimov's mother spent the whole night by the bedside of the sufferer. She installed herself on a rug on the floor and covered herself with an old coat, but could not sleep because she had to get up every minute. Ivan Ilyich had a terrible attack of colic. Madame Pseldonimov, a woman of courage and greatness of soul, undressed him with her own hands, took off all his things, looked after him as if he were her own son, and spent the whole night carrying basins, etc., from the bedroom across the passage and bringing them back empty. And yet the misfortunes of that night were not yet over. Not more than ten minutes after the young people had been shut up alone in the drawing room, a piercing shriek was suddenly heard. Not a cry of joy, but a shriek of the most sinister kind. The screams were followed by a noise, a crash, as though of the falling of chairs, and instantly there burst into the still dark room a perfect crowd of exclaiming and frightened women, attired in every kind of déshabillé. These women were the bride's mother, her older sister, abandoning for a moment the sick children, and her three aunts, even the one with a broken rib dragged herself in. Even the cook was there, and the German lady who told stories, whose own feather bed, the best in the house and her only property, had been forcibly dragged from under her for the young couple, trailed in together with the others, all these respectable and sharp-eyed ladies had, a quarter of an hour before, made their way on tiptoe from the kitchen across the passage and were listening in the anteroom, devoured by unaccountable curiosity. Meanwhile, someone lighted a candle, and a surprising spectacle met the eyes of all. The chairs supporting the broad feather bed only at the sides had parted under the weight, and the feather bed had fallen between them on the floor. The bride was sobbing with anger. This time she was mortally offended. Pseldonimov, morally shattered, stood like a criminal caught in a crime. He did not even attempt to defend himself. Shrieks and exclamations sounded on all sides. Pseldonimov's mother ran up at the noise, but the bride's mama on this occasion got the upper hand. She began by showering strange and for the most part quite undeserved reproaches, such as, A nice husband you are after this. What are you good for after such a disgrace? And so on. And at last carried her daughter away from her husband, undertaking to bear the full responsibility for doing so with her ferocious husband, who would demand an explanation. All the others followed her out, exclaiming and shaking their heads. No one remained with Pseldonimov except his mother, who tried to comfort him, but he sent her away at once. He was beyond consolation. He made his way to the sofa and sat down in the most gloomy confusion of mind, just as he was, barefooted and in nothing but his night attire. His thoughts whirled in a tangled crisscross in his mind. 
At times, he mechanically looked about the room, where only a little while ago, the dancers had been whirling madly, and in which the cigarette smoke still lingered. Cigarette ends and sweetmeat papers still littered the slopped and dirty floor. The wreck of the nuptial couch and the overturned chairs bore witness to the transitoriness of the fondest and surest earthly hopes and dreams. He sat like this almost an hour. The most oppressive thoughts kept coming into his mind, and such as the doubt, what was in store for him in the office now? He recognized with painful clearness that he would have, at all costs, to exchange into another department, that he could not possibly remain where he was after all that had happened that evening. He thought, too, of Mlekopitaev, who would probably make him dance the Cossack dance next day to test his meekness. He reflected, too, that though Mlekopitaev had given 50 rubles for the wedding festivities, every farthing of which had been spent, he had not thought of giving him the 400 rubles yet. No mention had been made of it, in fact. And indeed, even the house had not been formally made over to him. He thought, too, of his wife, who had left him at the most critical moment of his life, of the tall officer who had dropped on one knee before her. He had noticed that already he thought of the seven devils which, according to the testimony of her own father, were in possession of his wife, and of the crutch in readiness to drive them out. Of course, he felt equal to burying a great deal, but destiny had let loose such surprises upon him that he might well have doubts of his fortitude. So Pseldonimov mused dolefully. Meanwhile, the candle end was going out, its fading light falling straight upon Pseldonimov's profile through a colossal shadow of it on the wall with a drawn-out neck a hooked nose, and with two tufts of hair sticking out in his forehead and on the back of his head. At last, when the air was growing cool with the chill of early morning, he got up, frozen and spiritually numb, crawled to the feather bed that was lying between the chairs, and without rearranging anything, without putting out the candle end, without even laying the pillow under his head, fell into a leaden, death-like sleep, such as the sleep of men condemned to flogging on the morrow must be. On the other hand, what could be compared with the agonizing night spent by Ivan Ilyich Pralinsky on the bridal couch of the unlucky Pseldonimov? For some time, headache, vomiting, and other most unpleasant symptoms did not leave him for one second. He was in the torments of hell, the faint glimpses of consciousness that visited his brain lighted up such an abyss of horrors, such gloomy and revolting pictures, that it would have been better for him not to have returned to consciousness. Everything was still in a turmoil in his mind, however. He recognized Pseldonimo's mother, for instance, heard her gentle admonitions such as, Be patient, my dear, be patient, good sir. It won't be so bad presently. He recognized her, but could give no logical explanation of her presence beside him. Revolting phantoms haunted him. Most frequently of all, he was haunted by Semyon Ivanovich. But looking more intently, he saw that it was not Semyon Ivanovich, but Pseldonimov's nose. He had visions, too, of the free and easy artist and the officer and the old lady with her face tied up. What interested him most of all was the gilt ring which hung over his head, through which the curtains hung. He could distinguish it distinctly in the dim light of the candle end which lighted up the room, and he kept wondering inwardly, what was the object of that ring? Why was it there? What did it mean? He questioned the old lady several times about it, but apparently did not say what he meant, and she evidently did not understand it, however much he struggled to explain. At last, by morning, the symptoms had ceased, and he fell into a sleep, a sound sleep without dreams. 
He slept about an hour, and when he woke, he was almost completely conscious, with an insufferable headache and a disgusting taste in his mouth and on his tongue, which seemed turned into a piece of cloth. He sat up in bed, looked about him, and pondered. The pale light of morning, peeping through the cracks of the shutters in a narrow streak, quivered on the wall. It was about seven o'clock in the morning, but when Ivan Ilyich suddenly grasped the position and recalled all that had happened to him since the evening, when he remembered all his adventures at supper, the failure of his magnanimous action, his speech at table, when he realized all at once with horrifying clearness all that might come of this now, all that people would say and think of him, when he looked round and saw to what a mournful and hideous condition he had reduced the peaceful bridal couch of his clerk. Oh, then such deadly shame, such agony overwhelmed him that he uttered a shriek, hid his face in his hands, and fell back on the pillow in despair. A minute later, he jumped out of bed, saw his clothes carefully folded and brushed on a chair beside him, and seizing them, and as quickly as he could, in desperate haste, began putting them on, looking round and seeming terribly frightened at something. On another chair, close by, lay his greatcoat and fur cap, and his yellow gloves were in his cap. He meant to steal away secretly, but suddenly the door opened and the elder Madame Pseldonimov walked in with an earthenware jug and basin. A towel was hanging over her shoulder. She set down the jug and without further conversation told him that he must wash. Come, my good sir, wash. You can't go without washing. And at that instant Ivan Ilyich recognized that if there was one being in the whole world whom he need not fear, and before whom he need not feel ashamed, it was that old lady. He washed, and long afterwards, at painful moments of his life, he recalled, among other pangs of remorse, all the circumstances of that waking, and that earthenware basin, and the china jug filled with cold water in which there were still floating icicles, and the oval cake of soap at fifteen kopecks in pink paper with letters embossed on it, evidently bought for the bridal pair, though it fell to Ivan Ilyich to use it, and the old lady with a linen towel over her left shoulder. The cold water refreshed him, he dried his face, and without even thanking his sister of mercy, he snatched up his hat, flung over his shoulders the coat handed to him by Pseldonimov, and crossing the passage, and the kitchen where the cat was already mewing, and the cook sitting up in her bed, staring after him with greedy curiosity, ran out into the yard and into the street and threw himself into the first sledge he came across. It was a frosty morning. A chilly yellow fog still hid the house and everything. Ivan Ilyich turned up his collar. He thought that everyone was looking at him, that they were all recognizing him, all. For eight days he did not leave the house or show himself at the office. He was ill, wretchedly ill, but more morally than physically. He lived through a perfect hell in those days, and they must have been reckoned to his account in the other world. There were moments when he thought of becoming a monk and entering a monastery. There really were. His imagination, indeed, took special excursions during that period. He pictured subdued subterranean singing, an open coffin, living in a solitary cell, forests and caves. But when he came to himself, he recognized almost at once that all this was dreadful nonsense and exaggeration, and was ashamed of this nonsense. Then began attacks of moral agony on the theme of his existence manque. Then shame flamed up again in his soul, took complete possession of him at once, consumed him like fire and reopened his wounds. He shuddered as pictures of all sorts rose before his mind. What would people say about him? What would they think when he walked into his office? 
What a whisper would dog his steps for a whole year, ten years, his whole life. His story would go down to posterity. He sometimes fell into such dejection that he was ready to go straight off to Semyon Ivanovich and ask for his forgiveness and friendship. He did not even justify himself. There was no limit to his blame of himself. He could find no extenuating circumstances and was ashamed of trying to. He had thoughts, too, of resigning his post at once and devoting himself to human happiness as a simple citizen in solitude. In any case, he would have completely to change his whole circle of acquaintances, and so thoroughly as to eradicate all memory of himself. Then the thought occurred to him that this, too, was nonsense, and that if he adopted greater severity with his subordinates, it might all be set right. Then he began to feel hope and courage again. At last, at the expiration of eight days of hesitation and agonies, he felt that he could not endure to be in uncertainty any longer, and, un beau matin, he made up his mind to go to the office. He had pictured a thousand times over his return to the office as he sat at home in misery. With horror and conviction, he told himself that he would certainly hear behind him an ambiguous whisper, would see ambiguous faces, would intercept ominous smiles. What was his surprise when nothing of the sort happened? He was greeted with respect, he was met with bows, everyone was grave, everyone was busy. His heart was filled with joy as he made his way to his own room. He set to work at once with the utmost gravity. He listened to some reports and explanations, settled doubtful points. He felt as though he had never explained knotty points and given his decisions so intelligently, so judiciously as that morning. He saw that they were satisfied with him, that they respected him, that he was treated with respect. The most thin-skinned sensitiveness could not have discovered anything. At last, Akim Petrovich made his appearance with some documents. The sight of him sent a stab to Ivan Ilyich's heart, but only for an instant. He went into the business with Akim Petrovich, talked with dignity, explained things, and showed him what was to be done. The only thing he noticed was that he avoided looking at Akim Petrovich for any length of time, or rather, Akim Petrovich seemed afraid of catching his eye. But at last Akim Petrovich had finished and began to collect his papers. And there is one other matter, he began as dryly as he could. The Kirk Pseldonimov's petition to be transferred to another department. His Excellency Semyon Ivanovich Shipulenko has promised him a post. He pegs your gracious assent, your Excellency. Oh, so he's being transferred, said Ivan Ilyich, and he felt as though a heavy weight had rolled off his heart. He glanced at Akim Petrovich, and at that instant their eyes met. Certainly, I for my part, I will use, answered Ivan Ilyich, I am ready. Akim Petrovich evidently wanted to slip away as quickly as he could, but in a rush of generous feeling, Ivan Ilyich determined to speak out. Apparently some inspiration had come to him again. Tell him, he began, bending a candid glance full of profound meaning upon Akim Petrovich, tell Pseldonimov that I feel no ill will. No, I do not. That on the contrary, I am ready to forget all that is past, to forget it all. But all at once, Ivan Ilyich broke off looking with wonder at the strange behavior of Akim Petrovich, who suddenly seemed transformed from a sensible person into a fearful fool. Instead of listening and hearing Ivan Ilyich to the end, he suddenly flushed crimson in the silliest way, began with positively unseemly haste making strange little bows, and at the same time edging towards the door. His whole appearance betrayed a desire to sink through the floor, or more accurately, 
to get back to his table as quickly as possible. Ivan Ilyich, left alone, got up from his chair in confusion. He looked in the looking-glass without noticing his face. No, severity, severity, and nothing but severity, he whispered almost unconsciously. And suddenly, a vivid flush overspread his face. He felt suddenly more ashamed, more weighed down than he had been in the most insufferable moments of his eight days of tribulation. I did break down, he said to himself, and sank helplessly into his chair. End of section six, reading by Malone.